Hi, this is the overview video for Chapter 4, The Second Law of Thermodynamics. In Chapter 3, we covered the different types of thermodynamic processes, the work done over a thermodynamic process and the heat transferred. And in the intervening week, we also looked at a few heat engine cycles in detail in preparation of what we will cover in Chapter 4, where we finally wrap up our discussion of thermodynamics. In section 4.1, we talk about irreversibility, which is a topic we've been avoiding um, discussing in our uh, discussion of thermal processes. There's a separate video in which I lecture on the concepts of quasi-static processes and reversible processes. So please give that lecture video a look. And also this section where the textbook talks about how the idea of irreversibility affects the things that we've been discussing. And as you read through the section, pay particular attention to this first statement of the second law of thermodynamics also called the Clausius statement that heat never flows spontaneously from a colder object to a hotter object. You are going to see many statements of the second law of thermodynamics. And this is the first one that you will see because I think it's the first one that makes intuitive sense to most people. Section 4.2, heat engines, covers the general idea and concept of a heat engine but I thought it was a bit too schematic, especially for engineering physics. This is really why we covered the heat engine cycles in such detail last week. Now, do pay attention to this section. It does talk about some key formulas and ideas that are generally applicable to all heat engines, and it's uh, worth reviewing. We did talk about this last week that over a cycle of a heat engine, the work done by the heat engine can be found by the difference in the heat flows. And using that, you can come up with a general expression for efficiency of a heat engine. So uh, this is a bit more high level view than what I want you to end with. That's why we went over the specific examples of a heat engine cycles last week. And this would be a good review reminder in chapter 4. Section 4.3, Refrigerators and Heat Pumps, covers an application of heat engine cycles that are both practical and theoretically important. When we talked about reversible processes, that can sound a little bit too abstract. And well, heat pump is a real world device in which a heat engine cycle has been reversed so that it does the exact reverse of what a heat engine does. Instead of using the flow of a heat to produce mechanical work, it uses input of mechanical work to cause the heat to flow in the reverse direction than the usual direction. And this can result in a either a refrigerator, which I think everyone in the modern society are familiar with, or a heat pump, which can be a very efficient way to heat an uh, indoor environment of a home during colder weathers. And this is a good place to test your understanding of efficiency, because there's a way in which we define the heat engine efficiency, and that's one way, but there's a more general way to describe efficiency as a kind of ratio of what we want over what we have to put in to get what we want. And in talking about refrigerators or heat pumps, in a situation analogous to a heat engine, we are flipping what it is that we want and what it is that we have to provide. So you will see efficiency defined in a way that makes sense for refrigerators and heat pumps while still being consistent with how we talked about efficiency so far. And um, 
because these definitions of efficiency usually results in a number greater than 100%. We call them by a different name, coefficient of performance. But we are talking about efficiency or, I guess, effectiveness. And even though the devices themselves could be identical, the coefficient of performance of a refrigerator and coefficient of performance of a heat pump is defined slightly differently because what we want is slightly different for the refrigerator and the heat pump. In the case of refrigerator, what we want is heat removed from the low temperature reservoir. In the case of heat pump, what we want is heat put into high temperature reservoir. So looking at that and making sense of that will be a good way to check your own understanding of how we define efficiency in general cases. Section 4.4 finally covers the second law of thermodynamics in detail. It gives you a second statement or the Kelvin statement of the second law and this is the statement that would be most directly applicable for the systems we deal with that it is impossible to convert the heat from a single source into work without any other effect or it is impossible to create a heat engine that's 100% efficient in terms of um, efficiency of a heat engine and I have a separate lecture video on all the different statements of second law of thermodynamics so watch out for that and if you want you to work with only one statement of thermodynamics this is a good one to work with in the separate video I'll talk about how all these different statements are equivalent to each other uh, we do more mathematical details and sort of more fundamental reasoning. But this is a way to look at second law of thermodynamics that connects to what we focus our main attention on this unit, which is heat engines. In section 4.5, the Carnot cycle, the textbook covers Carnot cycle in detail. We have done this last week as one of the heat engine cycles we looked at in detail. So this will be an excellent review <laughs> for the one cycle your textbook covers in detail, how well you retained uh, what we covered in detail last week in context with the several other heat engine cycles. So in coverage of the Carnot cycle, your textbook does cover isothermal and adiabatic cycles and the work done and heat transferred during these processes. So any heat engine cycles which deal with isothermal and adiabatic processes, you can use the same approach you see in your textbook. The additional things we have covered last week are heat engine cycle processes that may involve isochoric and isobaric processes. Uh, which are actually somewhat more complicated than isothermal and adiabatic processes. Oh, and your textbook does uh, this uh, derivation of the Carnot efficiency. This is probably one most uh, useful formula about efficiency that I would say you should memorize. The primary reason being this formula allows you to quickly estimate what the maximum possible efficiency of a heat engine is without doing complex calculation that you have seen me do last week. In section 4.6, your textbook introduces entropy. And I didn't quite like how your textbook introduces it. So you will see uh, two separate lecture videos introducing entropy in a slightly different way. And I think there's a value in your seeing both approaches. So I do encourage you to read through the textbook. Don't ignore it just because I lecture on it in detail in a slightly different way. The reason I think there's a value in you seeing multiple approaches is both because of uh, how abstract the idea of entropy can be and how complex and nuanced they can be. So it's uh, worth seeing different approaches so that you can see 
how in certain ways they are similar and uh, to notice the differences. And it's in noticing the difference without one or the other way being necessarily wrong, both are correct, with a different emphasis and focus. So I do encourage you to read the textbook in detail and also watch my lecture video for a slightly different approach on entropy. So the upside here is that if you are confused by the textbook approach, there's some chance that you might find my approach more intuitive or vice versa. If my approach is too long-winded, then maybe you will like the textbook approach better. Now, one caution I want you to give you about the textbook approach. Um, so both of us talk about how the idea of entropy relates to the, the state of a system. It's what we call state function. And the textbook talks about how this uh, integral over a closed uh, reversible path and that for reversible process that this integral ends up being zero. And, and one kind of a maybe even slight correction is in this PV diagram of a heat engine cycle, the fact that the integral over this entire cycle ends up being zero, that is the entropy of a system at point A it returns to the same value after a one whole cycle. It's valid not only for reversible processes, but also for every single quasi-static processes. That is, any process that can be represented on a PV diagram. And the true distinction between reversible and the irreversible processes is not with what happens to the heat engine itself, but with uh, what happens to the environment. So with the reversible process, the change in entropy to the, of the heat engine over a whole cycle is going to be zero. And with the reversible process, that makes sense. And with the irreversible process, maybe there's friction so that it's still quasi-static but irreversible. Over one whole cycle, the change in the entropy of the heat engine is still zero. If that weren't the case, then we couldn't call it a state function because the defining feature of a state function is that when you come back to the same state, any change you had is zero. With the irreversible processes, where the difference happens is with the environment. So. So as the heat exchange takes place over this one cycle, there's a change happening to the environment, to the thermal reservoirs. So if any of these changes are irreversible, then for the environment, the total net change in entropy over one cycle is not necessarily zero. And that's what your textbook is getting at when they talk about this inequality here. You have to read the text very carefully. It says, when the process is irreversible, we expect the entropy of a closed system or the system and its environment to increase. So this inequality here applies to well, the way we physicists like to talk about the entire universe, or at a minimum, the system and its environment. Because the, the heat engine system itself is not a closed system. It's not an isolated system. It, ha it undergoes exchange of energy with its environment. So you have to understand that for the heat engine system itself, the delta S change of entropy is always zero because that's what it means for entropy to be a state function. What is different for an irreversible process is that when you include the entropy change of the environment, that will be greater than zero if you have an irreversible process. So do take care in reading through this section.
I do have uh, two separate videos introducing entropy from an entirely different considerations from your textbook section. And I have actually another video that talks about um, entropy and really the second law of thermodynamics in more general terms. So uh, watch out for those lecture videos. And I hope between these different coverages that you will find something that makes sense to you. The chapter four ends with a section 4.7, entropy on a microscopic scale. And I think the treatment in this section is a bit um, too abstract. I mean, it does talk about the idea of disorder and how the concept of entropy relates to disorder. Um, I mean, do read it through the section. Um, maybe it's just me who thinks it's uh, too abstract and imprecise. Um, I do have a separate lecture video that kind of gives you a more statistical treatment on the idea of entropy and disorder. I said at the beginning of this uh, thermodynamics unit that in thermodynamics, we introduce no new laws of nature that everything in thermodynamics can be derived from the principles of mechanics and statistical tools. And where you really do that is in the upper division version of thermodynamics or statistical mechanics. And in this lower division coverage of thermodynamics, I'll give you some glimpse into the statistical consideration that goes into it. So watch out for that in another separate lecture video. All right, so that's the overview of chapter four. Sorry, there's so many references to other videos and that's just how this chapter goes. And uh, let me know of any questions. And this is our last chapter on thermodynamics and we will continue this semester with the coverage of electricity and magnetism. And that'll be a lot of fun. So I look forward to that. Bye.